So I see the participants are joining in. So here we go. Okay, maybe we should get started. Um, hello, everybody. Um, you know, good morning or good afternoon and good evening from depends on what part of the world you are. Um, so my name is Rohit Agarwal. I'm the chair of the Medical Advisory Board. Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, annual patient conference of the Myositis Association, TMA. Uh, for today's session, for now, uh, this session, we have an excellent panelist of pulmonologist, dermatologist, uh, neurologist, rheumatologist. Um, and what we're gonna do is, um, you know, I'm gonna invite each panelist to talk about themselves, to talk about their work that they have done in myositis or any future plans in myositis. Um, and then uh, each one of us will do that. And then the last hour, we'll keep it for Q&A. Um, so if you, when the speakers are, panelists are talking about their work or about myositis, perhaps if you have any questions, please note down the questions or you can post the questions in the chat. Uh, and then we will take the questions in the Q&A session, which will be, the, which will be following our um, your discussion. Um, so I will uh, start off with Dr. Uh, Victoria Wirth, um, who's a dermatologist. Um, so Dr. Wirth, uh, please um, go ahead and um, you know, give an introduction and um, uh, give us what, you, what your thoughts are on myositis. Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, good. So, and you can see my slides. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the skin component of dermatomyositis. Uh, I am a dermatologist, uh, and these are my conflicts, which I have to admit are rel relatively new and a very good sign for dermatomyositis, that there are companies interested in developing new therapies for um, dermatomyositis overall and, and for the skin. Uh, so my professional activities I've really listed here. I'm on the medical advisory board for the Myositis Association. Um, I'm a co-chair of the IMAX Outcome Assessment Special Interest Group. Uh, I do a number of clinical trials in dermatomyositis. Uh, and I also do translational research related to studying mechanisms in the context of clinical trials, as well as basic research related to uh, how inflammation is mediated in uh, dermatomyositis. So um, some of the projects that I'm involved with are um, I, have, I de designed um, an NIH-funded trial on lenabasum, uh, lenabasum is the other way to pronounce that, for a non-psychoactive cannabinoid CB2 agonist. So non-psychoactive because it doesn't bind CB1. Um, I have an NIH grant to study um, how agonists, these CB2 agonists have effects in skin and on their cells. Uh, we're the site of an anti-interferon beta trial as well as a Hyzentra trial, which is a sub-Q formulation of IVIG. I just want to review some of the results we've had with lenabasum, which um, ha had been a very promising drug and update you on where things stand a little bit. Um, and this was a very small phase two study that we did, um, which showed that in the blue line that pe people did better in terms of their skin activity uh, relative to controls. And it was statistically significant after a relatively short trial, largely because skin is a, is a good way of seeing uh, results um, of studies. And this is the kind of result we were able to see, and this was week 12 here relative to baseline. So the, you can see a lot of erythema here and the typical findings of the skin and dermato, and then a lot of clearing. So there are also these clinical changes that were also accompanied by um, very important collection of patient reported outcomes that related to um, the patient's um, perception of how their skin activity was, as well as skin deck symptoms and uh, a pain interference. And what this shows is all the blue lines are improvement and you can see the, the placebo group really not so much happening. And so this seemed to be helpful for a patient perspective as well. And then we were able to study in the lab um, what happens in patients who got lenabasum relative to placebo. And here you can appreciate that the uh, brown uh, cells, these inflammatory cells, uh, really pretty much resolved at week 12, whereas there was really no change here in placebo. And this is just showing the kinds of changes that we saw. And there was a statistical change in the numbers of inflammatory cells relative to placebo. 
So very exciting. And then a long-term extension that was just rel relatively recently presented going out, believe it or not, 156 weeks is showing you know, continued improvement, but this is an uncontrolled part of the trial, it's open label extension. This was the early part um, at the very beginning where you can see a difference um, between the placebo and then the drug. But then over time, everybody gets drug and gets better. And so you don't know if this is the drug or just the disease course or background medication. But it suggests that you know the people did pretty well while they were on it. It was also relatively safe and toler tolerated very well. Mm -hmm. And the, some of the side effects were usually very transient. And so this was really um, seen from a patient perspective um, not to be very difficult to take. So the phase three results came out uh, top level in June of 2021. It's available online. And um, the primary endpoint was the TIS, um, and this was not met. And so the, the trial was deemed a failure. However, it's really important to drill down on the details and to notice that the TIS is really very much more about muscle than skin. And when you took patients who were weak, they actually did get better uh, with a statistically significant endpoint here of a p-value less than 0.05. And the skin, similarly, if people had enough skin activity, you can see, again, a very important improvement. And skin was a secondary uh, endpoint. But just because this primary endpoint wasn't made, it has put this whole uh, development pathway a little bit into question. And um, I think that's um, problematic and hopefully additional work can be done to, to be able to uh, have this successful uh, therapy uh, presented. So there's ongoing biomarker and mechanistic work um, in terms of the CB2 approach uh, uh, to treatment. And this is actually funded by NIH. And I want to review a little bit very briefly just about the fact that there are certain proteins in the skin, certain interferons, which are um, seen very much in the skin uh, and in the blood and in the muscle um, of patients um, who have dermatomyositis. And these are, these are interferon beta, interferon gamma, uh, and, but there are other genes that are not there that are interferons. And so what we can see is um, that the correlation of the signatures of interferon is with, again, interferon beta and interferon gamma, but not other forms of interference. So we're learning more about which types of interference are driving um, the skin uh, activity. And then some of the work that is just coming out of our lab is showing, for instance, that the cells in the skin tend to be uh, a myeloid dendritic cell, which is very different from um, uh, what would have seen what was potentially thought where there might be more of the CD123 plasma cytoid dendritic cells. We really don't find them very much in the skin. It's really much more about monocytes and myeloids. And so this was initial studies where we were actually able to stain with antibodies each of these different markers and be able to determine a little bit about what cells are in the skin. We've also been able to show that um, the itching, which is such a huge problem and something that we still need a lot of work on in terms of to address, um, seems to be at least partially uh, involved IL-31, which is a itch cytokine that we know is important in other d diseases like um, atopic dermatitis, eczema. And so here what I'm showing is that IL-31 is high in the lesions of DM um, relative to non-lesional or healthy controls. And in fact, this is, seems to be, you know, there may be ways of trying to think about blocking some of the itch in the future. We've got, we're going on now to do a specialized test called tissue mass cytometry, where you can actually look at many cells at the same time, but also look at um, what's inside the cells. What are the pathways that are activated? And you can figure out, you know, in, on an individual basis, uh, which, which cells are making which, which of these pathways activated and which of these proteins that are driving some of the immune response. And what this is showing in this panel is really each individual patient in terms of each of all of these different cells that are all different color across the line, um, and they're different from patient to patient, but what this is showing is that the controls here, the healthy controls, look really different. Um, there really are not so many of these macrophages and myeloid DCs that we're seeing up here um, in, in the disease and, and, the control, and not in the controls. And so there's a lot of work to be done to look at this in the context of um, different sorts of skin patients and different types of responses to therapy. And so that's ongoing work. I also just want to highlight that I think immunostimulatory herbs, we have a lot to learn about. 
um, but this is recently published from our um, uh, clinical work, and it's showing that people with dermatomyositis seem to have much more use of immunostimulatory herbs and also spirulina. And we've got some lab work that kind of supports this as well. Um, but, but this is concerning, and so we're trying to um, make people aware that if they have dermatomyositis, it might be helpful um, to be really careful reading the labels and not to take things that have herbs that may be stimulating the immune system. And so I want to just end on talking a little bit about criteria because uh, we all talk about dermatomyositis, but the first thing is we have to be able to diagnose it. And um, so this is just showing that the skin findings in both, you're not supposed to be able to read this table, but what it shows is that the skin findings in classic dermato, meaning muscle and skin, and those who have only skin are similar in frequency and type. And so there's really not a difference from the skin perspective um, in, this, in these uh, two manifestations of this uh, really continuum of a disease. And the older criteria that we used to use um, really meant that people had to have muscle disease to be called dermatomyositis. But now we know that skin, uh, patients can have skin predominant disease and um, they would not have been captured uh, in, in this kind of classification scheme. And what that meant is a lot of people really did not get diagnosed with dermatomyositis and got called other things, um, sometimes lupus and sometimes other types of diagnoses. Many of the, and you can see why, because for instance, in lupus criteria, um, people have a malar rash, photosensitivity, a positive ANA, and oral ulcers, all things that we can see in dermatomyositis. And the biopsy of the skin, although helpful in putting into an autoimmune category, doesn't differentiate between lupus and dermato. So I think, you know, again, these are highlights, but to also indicate that the diagnosis of DM, um, this is something we had published, only about 45% of patients um, when they're referred for an autoimmune problem and have dermato have been diagnosed ahead of time. And so what they've been uh, diagnosed with has been lupus, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, either not diagnosed or something completely different. And so this has been a real hurdle for the patients who have more of the skin part of the disease. So with the new criteria that Ingrid Lumberg helped lead an effort to do, um, we now have three skin variables um, that can identify a patient as having dermatomyositis, and you need to have two of these in order to be qualified as um, uh, likely to have dermato. So when we've applied this to our prospective database, we find that we can capture nearly three quarters of our patients using these three criteria. But that means we're also missing 25%. Um, and so although these are classification criteria, many times they're often used for diagnosis. And so we would like to think that we can maybe do a little more sensitivity and capture more people. Um, and so we have an ongoing study that we'll be doing over the next, uh, it's ongoing, but it will be hopefully completed in, within the next year, where we're collecting um, cases of dermatomyositis and then controls that are mimickers, and then applying and looking at a number of different variables um, to see if there are others that we should be including uh, potentially uh, in uh, dermatomyositis criteria. And we're working very closely with Dr. Lumberg, and the plan would be to potentially use these in a, a, a study that um, she would be planning to lead in the future. So in summary, many new therapies that may improve uh, dermato skin disease are on the horizon, which is very exciting. <coughs> I think we're getting more understanding of the cause of DM skin, and we have new criteria which are better at identifying the skin, and we may be able to improve sensitivity with ongoing study that uh, we're doing. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Ward, for this um, excellent presentation. Um, um, so those who have questions for Dr. Ward on her presentation or in general about uh, skin manifestations in dermatomyositis, perhaps please note down your questions. Um, and I will go to the next speaker, Dr. Um, Chilanda Johnson, who is a pulmonologist. Um, so Dr. Johnson, if you could introduce yourself and provide uh, any updates that you may have. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. And so my name is Shalanda and I'm a, a pulmonologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, my clinical focus is in interstitial lung disease and I also do clinical research in the same area. Um, my focus has been on patients who have ILD or related to having underlying autoimmune disorders and I have a special emphasis on patients who have myositis. Um, my research to date has largely focused on looking at the factors that a patient inherits 
and how they influence their risk of developing ILD and the setting of having myositis. Um, and I do have some recent data that I hope to publish soon that has shown that um, the factors that lead to risk in myositis in general also independently lead to risk for ILD. And so that the same genes that a patient inherits that can cause the skin and muscle findings independently increase risk for having lung involvement. Um, and this is an important finding because it shows that there's something about those genes and the interaction with a particular patient that increases risk. And so my plan to leverage that data and move it forward is to look at the specific types of inflammatory cells that interact with those genes that I've found are active in the lungs of patients who have myositis. And we're gonna do this uh, initially by looking at lungs that have come from patients who have undergone a lung transplant um, because these are obviously um, easy to get. And most of our patients who have myositis ILD who do not need a lung transplant often don't have lung tissue available because a biopsy is not needed to establish the diagnosis. And my hope is similar to what Dr. Work just presented very nicely is to be able to show um, which type of cells function differently in the lungs of patients who have myositis with ILD um, and if there are any abnormal um, proteins that are produced, are these viable targets for future therapies? Um, additionally, to looking at the lungs, I'm also interested in looking at the activation of immune cells in patients who have myositis with ILD, who are responding to therapy. So patients who have received treatment are, and who are in clinical remission compared to patients who receive treatment and despite receiving what we think should be adequate therapy, continue to progress. And again, to understand what's different about those two groups of patients, and could we develop better therapies for those patients who don't respond to traditional therapy? Thank you, Dr. Um, Johnson. Um, uh, so please uh, note down your questions for Dr. Johnson um, or any questions on interstitial lung disease um, in general. Um, I'm going to invite now Dr. Marianne De Weiser uh, for her presentation um, and introduction and presentation. Uh, she's a neurologist. So if you have any neurology focused questions, please uh, keep it um, uh, note down those questions as well. Marianne. Thank you, uh, Rohit. Uh, yes, my name is Marianne De Visser. I'm a neurologist based at the uh, Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands, and I've been involved in um, myositis research for about 20 years. Uh, our research uh, was, is in particular, trying to find therapies with less side effects. Uh, so we have uh, uh, conducted a, a trial in which we uh, compared um, daily prednisone with uh, what we call pulse therapy uh, dexamethasone, which is also a corticosteroid uh, and is given for four consecutive year, uh, days. And we found that both are equally effective. However, dexamethasone has uh, less side effects. Uh, we uh, uh, also uh, conducted a trial with uh, solo therapy of immunoglobulin uh, when the patient has been uh, diagnosed with myositis uh, for an, a nine weeks. Um, and we found that um, it was a small trial, uh, no controls, 20 patients. And we found that 10 patients uh, um, responded favorably to uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, uh, but, but uh, half of them uh, did not. Um, and those are um, um, the, the clinical trials we conducted. And I'm going to share my screen now for, um, let's see. Uh, the trials we are, the studies we are uh, doing now. Um, one is called uh, the ADAPT, which means that we are going to uh, figure out um, which tests have to be done uh, to be able to establish the right diagnosis. 
uh, in most diagnostic criteria, uh, we uh, rely on uh, the, the history uh, you as patients tell us when the problem started, uh, uh, how, uh, how, the, uh, how fast the symptoms uh, have developed over time. We do blood tests. Uh, often an EMG is, is done. Uh, not always, but often an MRI is, is done and a muscle biopsy. And uh, currently, um, lots of antibody testing is done is being done. But we don't know whether we really need an EMG and whether an MRI should be done or whether ultrasound of the muscle also suffices. So we are going to include, and we already did include uh, 40 patients, we are going to include 100 patients who uh, will be subjected to all the tests. And then uh, there is a expert panel who will decide uh, after all the tests have been done, whether a patient really has myositis or not, and which tests are really necessary uh, to contribute to the diagnosis. That's one uh, study. And the other study is um, going to start um, next week. Uh, it's called Time is Muscle, like brain in muscle with strokes. And uh, that uh, is a follow-up study on the immunoglobulin study I just mentioned. Uh, patients are going to be uh, treated with immunoglobulin and standard treatment of prednisone versus uh, prednisone alone. So that is uh, a study with a control group. Uh, and um, there are several what we call outcome measures. You've heard uh, from Dr. Worth about the TIS, the Total Improvement uh, Score. Uh, Dr. Agarwal knows all about it because uh, he uh, was responsible for the publications uh, uh, on the TIS. And that is what we call a composite score in which we have uh, scores from uh, patients about uh, their health condition from doctors. It uh, includes muscle strength. Uh, it also includes whether a patient has skin involvement or lung involvement, and it includes the, uh, the uh, muscle protein CK. So that's the, the uh, primary outcome measure, but we also measure uh, quality of life, whether patients suffer from fatigue, uh, from pain and physical functioning. So that's going to start next week. And then I would like to share with you some information about what we call the OMEREct outcome uh, measures um, um, that started in, uh, uh, in rheumatology. Uh, and it uh, tries to find outcome measures um, uh, which, according to patients, are uh, important. So for neurologists and rheumatologists, it's often the muscle strength. But uh, after uh, surveys and focus uh, groups, we found that uh, patients find fatigue, pain, physical activity, and physical um, uh, function much more important than, for instance, muscle strength or swallowing difficulty or whatever. It was started by um, Dr. Lisa uh, Christopher Stein and Dr. Elian Alexanderson. She is from Sweden, and Dr. Uh, Christopher Stein is based at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher uh, McAuley, also based at uh, Johns Hopkins, is uh, the principal investigator. And uh, there are two uh, patient advocates, Ingrid de Groot, she's from the Netherlands, and uh, Catherine uh, Sarver. And you find here the other working group members um, from uh, the Netherlands, myself, from Sweden, other working group members from Korea and from uh, USA. And what we hope to find is outcome measures um, yeah. that can really help us to uh, decide whether a drug uh, is effective uh, or not. And, and as I said, we are currently testing uh, these uh, four uh, outcome measures uh, in all the centers I mentioned. Um, I think that uh, is about it, uh, Rohit. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Marianne, for that excellent presentation and the work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Sonia Danoff, who's also a pulmonologist, to give an update, introduction and update. 
Thank you. I am going to try to share my screen. Let me see. Oops, let me see if I can get it. Oops. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we are able to see your screen. Thanks. So, um, hi, my name is Sonia Danoff. I'm a pulmonary doctor or lung doctor from Johns Hopkins. And um, I, I wanted to just take a second because I think that um, when you come to, um, to a myositis meeting, which focuses around muscle, that sometimes it's unclear why would there be two lung doctors talking at that, at that session? And so I'm just gonna take a second and go back through, for those of you who may be familiar, or maybe for those who are not familiar, what, how the lung is involved in this. Um, and I'm gonna try to sprinkle in um, comments about the research that we're doing at various points um, of this whole process of understanding the lung involvement. And I want to be very clear that I'm talking about work that I do with a large group of people. This is certainly not um, a single player sport. This is a team sport. And, um, and I also want to really acknowledge that Shalonda Johnson has been a big part of the research that we've done both at Hopkins and now that she's doing at University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm going to just take a second to talk about how, what, how the lung works. I'm going to tell you what interstitial lung disease, and I'm going to talk about how we diagnose and treat it. And that's really going to cover the waterfront of what we do from a research standpoint. So um, fortunately for those of us who are pulmonary doctors, um, the lungs are actually very simple. They really only contain really three elements. There's an airway, which is the tube that connects your mouth down to your lungs. It helps the air get from the outside world to your lung, which because the ear is constantly bathing, it is actually really in the outside world, much like the skin is. So many of the things that Dr. Worth talked about in terms of how things activate the immune system have to do with the same sort of triggers that the lung is in contact with the outside world. There are blood vessels and the blood vessels are important because they bring the red blood cells close to where the air sacs are in the lung. And that allows oxygen to get transferred from the air sac into the bloodstream. And just much like if you're using um, a gas motor, uh, you need oxygen in order to burn fuel. So air is necessary in a gasoline motor in order to burn the fuel efficiently and oxygen is necessary in tissue to burn the energy that we use to move and to do all of our activities. And then finally, there's this part called the alveolar air sacs. And Basically what happens is that the lung branches and branches, much like you can see in this picture, down to these very fine, small air sacs. And that's where the air from the outside world comes in very close contact with the blood. And that's important because obviously that's where the oxygen is transferred into the blood, but it's also important because that's where all of the components of the air come in contact with the immune system. And so essentially you can think about that as being like the surface of the skin in that it is in contact with all of the things that are, uh, that are in the air. Now, when the lung works well, what happens is that the air just travels down this branching pathway. It ends up in these air sacs. And these air sacs bring the the components of the air very close to the components of the bloodstream. So when you breathe in air, air has about 21% oxygen in it. And oxygen is really the part that we need in order to make the body work. However, when there's damage to the lung, when we have this thing called interstitial lung disease, then this area where the oxygen gets into the blood gets damaged. And so one of the things that we think a lot about is why is it that this, this area of the lung becomes damaged and what can we do to try to preserve it? How in a patient who has a disease that injures it, how are we able to protect that part of the lung? So this gets to the whole question of myositis. So myositis, myo, and dermato means skin, myo means muscle. So where's the lung in the name of this disease? Well, um, unfortunately, uh, it was not something that was recognized early on when this disease was being described. And so although lung disease is actually a fairly common component for people who have anti syndrome 
or dermato or polymyositis, it doesn't include that name. The lung does have muscles and it's very important muscles. It's got the muscle of the diaphragm, which is one of the largest muscles of breathing. And for sure, when you get muscle involvement, it can certainly affect the muscles of breathing. But the lung is also injured. And that's despite the fact the lung does not have muscles in it. And the lung is not really the skin, even though it kind of has similarities. So the lung is yet another organ that can be affected in, this, in these disease states. Now, what we describe as this, um, this process called interstitial lung disease, which you heard Dr. Johnson talk about, is that when the uh, immune cells are activated, it causes something called inflammation. And that can sometimes be monitored. Your doctors may send a CRP or a SED rate. Those are markers of inflammation. You can look at it in a, in a, um, a test tube as Dr. Worth does to see how activated these immune cells are. But what happens is that ultimately this activation leads to scarring and, and stiffness in the lung. Now we want to try to stop this process before it gets to a point of scarring because at least at this point in time, we don't really know how to make scarring reverse, but we can definitely do lots of things to decrease inflammation. So one of the very big focuses that many people have is firstly, um, why is it that um, some people who have this disease or have, have uh, dermatomyositis or polymyositis, why is it some of them get interstitial lung disease and other people don't? And Dr. Uh, Johnson very nicely presented the fact that there is probably also a genetic component that is something that you inherit that makes some people more susceptible than others. There may be other things, including things in the environment, and that's um, an area of interest for a lot of groups, including uh, folks at the National Institutes of Health. There may be even other things like infections and other, other um, uh, injuries that occur to the lung that make people susceptible to it. So we want to understand why do people develop interstitial lung disease? Are there ways when a person is diagnosed that we could say, you're somebody who's likely to develop interstitial lung disease, and, but you're not somebody who's going to be likely to develop it. So that's one of the big things we're looking at is trying to predict the risk of interstitial lung disease. Okay. Now what happens when you get interstitial lung disease? Well, you get this, this process of inflammation and scarring around the air sacs, and that causes a breakdown in the connection between the air sacs and the blood vessels. And so oxygen doesn't transfer as easily into the bloodstream. And you need that oxygen in order to, to burn the fuel efficiently. And so uh, when that occurs, people develop symptoms and the symptoms are different, but the most common symptoms really shortness of breath, especially with activity. There are also a lot of people who develop cough and some people just recognize that they feel tired. So when um, one of the things that we really are trying to do um, from both a research and a clinical standpoint is to try to help people recognize early when these symptoms might occur that they might be related to the involvement of the lung. Because we think that the earlier you take care of this problem, the better it is. Much like Dr. DeVisser mentioned this early intervention for preventing muscle damage, we also think that early intervention can prevent lung damage. Now, how do we diagnose interstitial lung disease? Well, there are a lot of different ways it's diagnosed, and probably the one that you may be most familiar with is that the doctor just puts uh, something called a stethoscope up against your chest and listens, asks you to breathe. And there's a sound that we often hear, something called crackles. That doesn't always occur. Sometimes it doesn't happen, even in patients who have interstitial lung disease. So we also have to use other things like radiographic tests, like CT scans, and uh, physiologic tests called pulmonary function testing. And each of these helps us build the picture of somebody having interstitial lung disease. Much like Dr. DeVister was mentioning regarding what is the minimal number of tests or what is the best test to figure these out, one of the things we're very interested in is how is it best to detect when people have interstitial lung disease so we can intervene early and again, trying to get people to therapy as quickly as they can be Often there's um, a delay in the diagnosis because you know, if the first symptoms you develop are the lung symptoms, it may take a while before your doctors really think about maybe this is not just a pneumonia or asthma or COPD. It might be something more systemic like, um, like myositis or another autoimmune disease. 
And again, just to, um, um, to uh, reinforce what Dr. Johnson said, we rarely need to do lung biopsies because often if we find a patient who has interstitial lung disease, we can test their blood to see if they have markers of myositis or other autoimmune diseases. And that way we don't have to do an invasive procedure to make the diagnosis. All right, so why is it important to, to, to identify people with interstitial lung disease? Well, you know, it, it's, it's not always apparent when people have interstitial lung disease. Shortness of breath can occur when you have muscle weakness and maybe you're not exercising as much. So it's very important to actually look for this symptom. Um, it can actually get worse. The lung disease can get worse even as the skin and muscle disease gets better. So sometimes we're reassured by the fact that the muscle enzymes are coming down, but somebody's telling us, oh, you know, I still feel short of breath. And that's an important piece that the lungs can actually function independently of the other organs. And then because the lungs are actually so essential for survival in patients with myositis, really treatment decisions need to be driven by lung disease if that's what's present. And it can be life-threatening. And this is some of the work that Dr. Johnson did while she was at Johns Hopkins was showing that actually having interstitial lung disease, even though it's a better, it's not a disease that causes um, severe impairment in a lot of patients, it still makes outcomes much worse if you do have interstitial lung disease than if you don't have interstitial lung disease. And so we're very interested in trying to, you know, intervene at this level, making sure that people are recognizing interstitial lung disease, and then thinking about what are the best treatment decisions. So really the question is, how is this gonna impact people's lives? It's different for each person. Um, medications often help people. Some people require oxygen. Many people find pulmonary rehabilitation is valuable. We're really trying to focus in on each of these areas, uh, very much like Dr. DeVisser was talking about um, the OMER Act. What we're very interested in is outcome measures that actually matter to our patients. You know, we tend to measure things like CT scans and breathing tests, pulmonary function tests, but those aren't necessarily things that you feel inside. So we're also trying to develop better ways of assessing how our patients feel and what the impact is of lung disease on them. We're trying to uh, really work with many different groups to try, to try to find out which medications work best for which patients. We agree there is very likely kind of personalized medicine, much as there should be for muscle and skin disease, there will be for lung disease. We're very interested in how oxygen impacts people. Does it, um, how does it work in terms of making people feel better, being able to function better? What are, the, um, what are the impacts in terms of how people feel about their own lives if they're using oxygen? And then finally, uh, you know, pulmonary rehab is such an important component of this and we often neglect it because it's not something that shows up in a bottle from the pharmacy, but it's something that we really wanna have people aware of and focus on. So I've kind of uh, given you uh, just a very broad brush strokes on interstitial lung disease. Again, I'm very fortunate to work with a wonderful group of colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. It's multidisciplinary. We sit side by side with each other. As many of you know, we sit side by side with each other on Friday afternoons, often late into the evening, um, but it has allowed us to bring together the perspectives of uh, pulmonologists, lung doctors, rheumatologists and neurologists, as well as uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I think that uh, really in the center of all of the work we're doing is the patient experience and how we can make um, our patients' lives better and uh, have their lives less impacted and less negatively impacted um, by their disease and particularly in my case, uh, by their lung disease. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Dr. Danoff. That was uh, uh, excellent presentation, and actually, I really um, loved your explaining the patients about the scarring and the fibrosis and how the oxygen reaches. I mean, I, I really feel that some of our patients would have, who may have had difficulty understanding when we are explaining in clinic, would have now understood after your presentation. Um, so. Um, with that, I think I'm going to um, speak. Um, my, my name is Rohit Agarwal. I'm a, a chair of the Medical Advisory Board of the TMA. I'm from University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm also the co-director of University of Pittsburgh Myositis Center. 
Um, and I have about uh, you know five different updates for you uh, from the past recent research in last one year and what we are going to do in next um, year or so. Um, so first of all, I will address uh, the biggest elephant in the room. I have attended this uh, medical advisory uh, board meetings and uh, TMA patient conference for years now. And every time uh, when I talk to the patients, one of the things come up that we don't have an FD approved treatment that really works or have been proven uh, by a phase three randomized controlled trial, which has been evaluated by FDA and, and approved. But this year, this is probably the best news I can ever uh, give to our patients that this year, if you know, or I, you, some of you may already know, IVIG was just approved for dermatomyositis by FDA, as well as uh, European um, uh, regulatory agencies. So that's, that's just happened last couple of months. And this was based on a phase three large randomized clinical trial uh, in which we studied uh, 45 patient, 95 patient total, 47 got drug, 48 did not get drug for 16 weeks. And at the end of 16 weeks, we saw that patients who got IVIG infusions in dermatomyositis, these are the patients who were had rash and had weakness, that about 80% of these patients improved while on IVIG at week 16 whereas only 40 to 45% patients who were on placebo improved. And the reason the patients on placebo often improve is there's something called placebo effect, and as well as they were also on background immune suppressive drug. Um, then, um, so this drug was obviously had some, um, you know, safety issues as some of you have been on IVIG know there are some safety concerns. And one of the safety concerns that came up was blood clot. Uh, however, we have figured out if we keep the infusion rate slow, if we keep, give slow infusion or give infusion over more days, the problem of blood clots through IVIG can be largely mitigated. So that's the, the best news that I have for you today, uh, that IVIG is now FDA and EMA approved uh, for dermatomyositis. Um, the second point I want to talk about is interstitial lung disease. And I want everybody to know that we have recently completed a clinical trial on myositis associated interstitial lung disease with a drug called Abatacept. Abatacept is a drug that is given once a week injection. Um, it's a self injection that patients take. And this drug has been already FDA approved for years now, being used for rheumatoid arthritis and several other uh, autoimmune conditions. And what we are doing now is we are testing this drug in myositis associated interstitial lung disease, including anti, mostly antisynthetase syndrome patients. So this trial is completed, but we don't know the results yet. Um, that's mainly because the analysis will start in January because we have to have all the patients finish the, all the parts of the study, and then we will start analyzing. So I'm hoping by next year, I will be able to present the results on this um, interesting uh, study. Uh, another, on another lines of ILD in myositis associated ILD and antisynthetase syndrome patients, we are going to study a drug uh, which actually causes, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, cuts down the fibrosis. It's an anti-scarring or anti-fibrotic drug. Um, so, so far, when we treat myositis interstitial lung disease or antisynthetase syndrome, we give them immune suppressive drug and largely, these immune suppressive drugs work. However, uh, the idea is since there is now antifibrotic drugs available, what about if we combine immune suppressive drugs along with antifibrotic drug? Could we have better results than just using immune suppressive drugs in our patients? And that's the question that has baffled uh, rheumatologists, um, you know, pulmonologists, and there is no really consensus. Should we be giving antifibrotic drugs to our myositis patients or not. And everybody has different opinions and different experiences. So with this study uh, that we are hoping to start soon, uh, we, we hope that we will be able to answer that question right on, that should we be combining uh, immune suppressive drug with antifibrotic drug, the drugs that cuts down the scarring and get better results for lung disease in our patients. Um, and then um, also, um, uh, you know, Dr. Worth talked about the classification, uh, how dermatomyositis classification can be problematic in some patients who mainly have skin problem. 
Similarly, our anti-synthetase syndrome patients, the patients who have anti-synthetase antibody, JO1, and other anti-synthetase antibody, have a problem where they don't always present with full clinical presentation. They sometimes start with the lung or joint, and sometimes there is a significant delay in their diagnosis. And we believe that one of the reasons there is a significant delay in their diagnosis is because we don't have a criteria that for antisynthetase syndrome. Like we have a criteria for dermatomyositis, polymyositis. We really don't have a criteria for antisynthetase syndrome. In an effort to overcome that limitation of antisynthetase syndrome, uh, we have um, uh, gotten a grant from American College of Rheumatology to, to develop a classification criteria for antisynthetase syndrome, uh, which is being um, currently being developed. And by hopefully by next year, I'll be able to share some results of that uh, big project. Now, this is one of the most, uh, the biggest international project I've ever done. This is about more than 150 centers in the country who are contributing cases, uh, not country, uh, in the world, who are contributing cases, more than 200 investigators around the world. And so far, we have collected more than 2,000 antisynthetase patients' um, uh, data and around 1,800 controls. So this is by far the largest data collection I've ever seen. Um, so we are hoping that a lot would come out of this. We'll learn a lot, not only about classification, but other aspects of the lung disease and antisynthetase syndrome. And, um, and then the last update I want to give is uh, I want to first of all thank uh, many of the TMA members uh, who about two years ago joined a study that we initiated at University of Pittsburgh. This was an NIH grant that we got called My Pacer Study. And many of you provided excellent data. It was a six month observational study online. So anybody could participate in the study. And we had a very overwhelming response to the study. We had 700 patients uh, who wanted to join the study, but we only could enroll 100. Um, and we got a lot of feedback from you. And because of that, we are going to soon launch uh, sort of a MyPacer 2 part of it so that in, in this time, we will have a lot more patients that can enroll in the study. So stay tuned for it. I will share the study information when it's available. These studies are easy for any member to join from anywhere in the world uh, because these are online studies. Um, so that's the old few updates that I have for our myositis patients. Um, and I think um, next we could go to a question and answers um, session. So what I would do is perhaps I will try to read the question loud so that everybody can hear. And then I will ask one of our panelists to see if they can, um, you know, uh, try to answer that question. And if someone else wants to add, obviously they're welcome to add. So um, the first question I have is from um, Kim um, Gary. Um, so first of all, Kim is saying that this conference is very helpful. However, Kim has concern that based on the severity of my dermatomyositis, um, they are trying to, they think, could I be misdiagnosed? Um, and that's a very important question. I think Dr. Ward could answer that, but let me finish the question first. Um, it says, I showed up in my urgent care in 2021 with rash on my eyelids and had muscle weakness in my ankles and both my knees, which made it difficult to walk and get out of chair and my wrist. Um, I lost grip in my arm and hands, and I was a pure mess. I, was, I am a disabled vet. Finally, was referred to a rheumatologist who took 15 vials of blood and came up with the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Uh, he then prescribed 20 milligrams of prednisone along with rituximab infusions every six months and a relief at last. So it seems like this patient did get better. But the question here is, will it progress to worse or will it go away? Um, so I think there are two questions here. One is because of the severity, could they be misdiagnosed? And the second question is, since they're better, they're asking, will it progress or would it go away? So I, uh, you know, maybe Dr. Worth could take a first stab at it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the fact that you have muscle disease and in combination with um, what I'm presuming is skin disease, although I can't really say that. Yeah, you had you had a rash on your eyelid. Rash on the eyelid. Yeah, so I, I would not be 
Um, you know, I would have to know a little bit more about, you know, how things were investigated. Um, I think there would have to be some uh, evaluation of the muscles to, to make sure. And, and, a, and a, you know, I'm assuming that they did a uh, CPK and Andalase and other things. So you have to have all those things done uh, to try to make sure it's the right diagnosis. But there's nothing here that would make me think that it's not the right diagnosis so far. Um, and, you know, so, so I think that would, and then in terms of the course, I mean, one of the things that's, I think, um, difficult is that the course is so diff different for different people. And so um, the fact that you've responded to therapy is often a very good sign. And I think often at the beginning is when people are absolutely the worst. And once you respond, um, it's, it's a good sign, prognostic factor for the future. But the disease can wax and wane. And then some people it wanes and almost goes away or goes away. And so it's very hard to totally anticipate what, what the future might hold for an individual person. Uh, thanks, Dr. Worth. And I would just add uh, uh, that, again, the fact that you're better makes it less likely to have problems in future, but obviously it can still wax and wane, as Dr. Worth said. Um, so I think I'm going to go to the next question, and I think this might be for pulmonologists. So I have ILD and antisynthetase syndrome. I've been getting rituximab infusions and seems to really help my pulmonary function. It's improving my PFTs and improving my CT scan. My insurance companies say that they will no longer pay for rituximab, but required to use truxima, which they say is a biosimilar. And is there any information on the efficacy of truxima versus rituximab? Perhaps I will let our um, Dr. Um, Danoff or Johnson to take um, to try to answer this. So I'm not aware of anything specifically in the realm of myositis ILD to compare the two, but um, you know the the kind of the notion of biosimilars is that uh, they are um, they are designed to have um, equivalent uh, effects, and uh, we've certainly been switching a lot of patients from um, brand name rituximab to Truxima. Um, and at least in my limited experience with that, we've been having good success with that. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there's a specific study that has actually compared the two of them. I'll have to turn it over to colleagues to see if they're aware of that. Um, Dr. Johnson, do you want to add anything? No, I'm not aware of any kind of direct study of that particular drug. And I mean, quite frankly, to be honest, a lot of the data on the use of rituximab is pretty limited as well. Um, and so to then have a study of a biosimilar would be a larger ask. And so I think at this time, we just don't know a lot about this. But again, as Dr. Daniel said, our thinking is that at least as drugs, those two should be quite similar in their efficacy. Yeah, I mean, from I can speak from the experience of rheumatology in general. Um, in general, the principle is that these biosimilar works as good as the original drugs uh, in terms of its uh, you know, effectiveness, in terms of its safety. So in general, we believe the biosimilars could be changeable with the original drug generally, not, not specifically for antisynthetase or ILD, but typically that's what the data suggests so far. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next question here. I was diagnosed with bronchiectasis at around two years after my disease diagnosis. I think they're referring the disease diagnosis as myositis. I'm TIF1 gamma autoantibody positive Dermatomyositis patients, 60 year old, 10 years into diagnosis. So seems like they developed bronchiectasis two years after the dermatomyositis diagnosis, which was itself 10 years ago. Do you consider bronchiectasis to be an ILD in this case? I have no underlying lung issues prior to dermatomyositis diagnosis. This is an excellent question for our pulmonary colleagues. Right. So what bronchiectasis is, is dilation of the airways. And so um, we think about bronchiectasis kind of simply in two flavors. There's simple bronchiectasis and then there's traction bronchiectasis. And so traction bronchiectasis occurs when you have um, basically pulling at the airway structures by surrounding scar tissue. And so seeing traction bronchiectasis is actually a feature of patients who have beneficial lung disease. Um, and so if, if you do not have any evidence of ILD, and this is actually simple bronchiectasis, then that would be a separate diagnosis 
And so those two things are not equated, but you can see them occur together. Um, and so I think I would need more information about the actual type of bronchiectasis that this patient has. But again, if there's no ILD present, it's unlikely to be a traction bronchiectasis. And so that would be something that you would see independent of having ILD. Next one. Thank you. Um, next question. Have dermatomyositis with significant breathing issues? I use an incentive spirometer daily, which seems to help. Please suggest how much to use per person generally strong and otherwise healthy. Currently doing 10 reps two times a day. Again, another interesting pulmonary question. You know, I think that um, uh, in general, the pulmonary community feels that um, exercises are beneficial for um, any of the diseases that affect the lungs. And I'll just make the point that, that in um, dermatomyositis, there can be lung disease, that is like the interstitial lung disease I talked about, but also the muscle disease that we talked about, the fact that the muscles can be affected and uh, the muscles of breathing can be affected in dermatomyositis. So the idea of exercising really all of the muscles of breathing through doing an incentive spirometer is a device that just allows you to visualize how much of a breath you're taking in and it encourages you to kind of measure uh, a slow deep breath and it allows you to kind of consciously expand your lungs you don't have to use a device like that in order to do it somebody else brought up the idea of the yogic breathing which is breathing from the diaphragm and all of those really help you be conscious uh, help you to be conscious of the muscles that are involved in the act of breathing. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, as a pulmonologist, I also like to have people uh, remember that in addition to exercising the muscles of the legs, it's very important to exercise the muscles of the arms and upper chest because those also contribute to your capacity for breathing. So really those kind of exercises can be incorporated into a whole body um, exercise program that will support not just your breathing, but all of the other muscles that are involved or might be affected by dermatomyositis. Excellent. Um, thanks a lot. And um, I was just, um, I wanted to also have everybody pay attention that Dr. Worth and Dr. Deviser has already answered some of these questions. So please read those uh, in addition to our discussion, but I will continue this format because it seems to be uh, sometimes more, more interactive. Um, so doctor, for Dr. Agarwal, I have had dermatomyositis for 13 plus year and just learned that I have TIF1 gamma antibody. Are there any study in works for standard criteria for long-term monitoring of malignancies? I understand the highest risk for first three to five years after dermatomyositis diagnosis, but who is studying which specific cancer to screen for, for what duration and how often over the long term of patient with dermatomyositis and anti tif one I think this is a great question. So um, I'm happy to report that, yes, your information is absolutely correct, that the highest risk is between in the first three years and then somewhat still much more uh, for five years. But after five years, what we see is the risk is of the same as general population, even in patients with anti tif one gamma antibody. So we are actually studying this currently. And in fact, uh, we are developing guidelines on how often should we screen for malignancy, what instrument, what test should be used for screening? Should it be once a year? Should it be more often? Should it be only in the beginning? And all sort of different questions that you're asking actually are being answered in the guideline, which we hope that will be published next year. Uh, but overall, I would say if it's been 13 plus years, you are your risk of malignancy is no longer uh, significantly more than a risk of malignancy without the dermatomyositis or TIF1. So you have a same frequency or, or chances of having cancer as anyone else on the street. Um, um, I don't know if Marion, do you want to add anything there? No, I agree with you, uh, Rohit. Thank you. Sure. Um, so next question, Dr. Worth, uh, thank you for your answers. I'm being treated for, for lupus with Benlista IV and dermatomyositis with IVIG. 
So it seems like lupus and dermatomyositis here. An immune suppressant as well as Plaquenil. Luckily, I'm doing better and can go in sun. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Dr. Ward, for answering that question. Um, Mike says, I have dermatomyositis as a systemic issue. Which doctor is best to be lead physician for me? I think this is a great question. So, you know, oftentimes when patients have dermatomyositis with systemic issues, patients ask, should I go to a dermatologist? Should I go to a rheumatologist or a neurologist? And I tell them that it's not about which type of doctor you go. It's all about does that doctor knows myositis or not? That's all that matters. Some, because there are in the field of myositis, we have pulmonologists, neurologists, rheumatologists, dermatologists, all of us treating myositis from different angles. But if your doctor knows myositis and have had experience, significant experience with myositis, that's the doctor you want to choose. Not going with a particular subspecialty, but going more with a doctor or a center that knows or uh, how to treat myositis. That would be my answer there. Would, would, I'm, I'm gonna ask other colleagues to see what they say. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, uh, Rohit. I, I um, think that um, many people don't have a lot of experience with dermatomyositis and then you know they are have trouble, as we said, even making a diagnosis. So being in a center that sees patients and independent of who that person is, as long as they know how to manage uh, and evaluate over time, uh, the co potential complications I think is the critical fa uh, factor. I would like to add, Roid, if I may, that uh, in my hospital, but I'm sure that that is also the case in, in other uh, countries, there are also multidisciplinary consultations in which the neurologist or the rheumatologist sits together with the pulmonologist and the dermatologist and, and, uh, and, and those uh, specialists together treat the patient if there are any difficulty. All right, thank you. Um... Uh, hello, my name is Christine. I have been diagnosed with polymyositis, antisynthetase syndrome, and ILD. I'm down to about less than 20% of lung capacity and a pre-transplant patient at UCLA. Years ago, there was a discussion in knowing the importance of various autoantibodies we carry, such as JO1, PL12, and so on. I know what antibody I carry. However, for people who, do, who don't know, can you talk about various antibodies and the benefit of knowing what antibody you carry? I think this is a great, um, again, I will have our pulmonary colleagues maybe answer this question. Yeah, so I, I think this is a fantastic question and it really does get at a lot of the information that we know is carried <clears throat> in a particular patient's autoantibody, which is that it can tell us a lot about an individual's risk of having certain organ involvement and from my bias, their risk of having interstitial lung disease. And then also it carries prognostic information in terms of um, risk of progression and then also severity of disease. And so for example, we know that antisynthetase antibodies, um, people who carry them are at much higher risk of having ILD than people who carry other forms of antibodies. For example, TIF1 gamma, which is unusual in ILD, not impossible, but unusual. Um, and then uh, anti-MDA5 autoantibodies also are highly associated with having lung involvement. And, and some patients, not all, but in some patients can be associated with a very rapidly progressive form of ILD where recognizing someone as having anti-MDA5 is very important because it will inform treatment decisions. Um, and what we've been doing, and I'm sure other centers have been doing in patients who have known NDA5 as being very aggressive upfront. And if I can, I'll share an anecdote. Um, we recently had a patient in the hospital um, with anti-NDA5 um, who was on uh, one liter of oxygen, doing okay, had some minimal shortness of breath, and in a matter of 72 hours was in the ICU. And again, this is not everyone's experience, but I think that because people had recognized and had started interventions early, this patient had a better outcome um, then if someone had not recognized early this patient had anti-NDA5 and potentially thought that they were well enough to go home when they were on just that low amount of oxygen versus watching them more closely given their underlying autoantibody. So 
Um, again, knowing the antibody can be really important in understanding risk for a particular organ involvement and also for um, deciding on how you're going to treat a patient. And I might just add one other comment, which is that um, for some of our patients, we actually can't name the autoantibody they have because we don't know all of the autoantibodies. So you may um, hear from your doctor, well, you know, we put all the autoantibodies and you don't have one, but that should be filtered as you don't have one that we know. Um, and part of the reason we've been able to understand this is because there's a wonderful research facility in Oklahoma that has been doing um, a very specific kind of analysis of the blood from patients that we have. And so they can tell us if a patient carries an antibody to something we recognize already, but they can also tell us if they carry an antibody to something we don't have a name for yet. And what we find is that maybe as much as a third of our patients carry an unrecognized or unnamed antibody. So just remember, there's a whole lot that we still don't know. And, and hopefully over the next, you know, the next 10 years, we'll know much more, but there may still be people who don't have a recognized antibody yet. Thank you. Um, so the next question is Mike, and this is an interesting question. Um, not an anti-vaxxer, simple purpose of COVID vaccine is to develop antibodies. If you have proven natural immunity to COVID or from COVID, why would vaccine be necessary and could it be harmful? Why is natural immunity being swept under the rug and not discussed? And I, I would love to take um, uh, answer this to start with, but I know some of our pulmonary colleagues and other colleagues may also have some different opinion about it. So from what I understand, what happens is when you have a natural immunity, um, you know, you get a COVID, you get COVID antibodies, you definitely are protected to some extent. But our natural immunity will wane over the period of time. And what vaccine does is basically when vaccine is given multiple times for that reason, because as one time immune system gets activated, has a memory, that memory can go down over time. But when vaccine, you see there are sometimes two doses, sometimes three doses, that's Second time, that is going to activate your immune system even more and can form more longer lasting memory uh, in many cases. So the studies have suggested if you have an immune um, natural immunity to COVID or you have developed vaccines after COVID infection, and now you get, um, uh, uh, you get antibodies after COVID infection, and now you get a vaccine, the response, the antibody response is multiple fold that is likely going to have more protection and longer protection than just having a COVID infection induced uh, antibodies. That's just my take on it. So that's why even in patients with COVID infection, I would strongly recommend vaccines on the top of COVID infection, maybe a time it that after some time of COVID infection, typically we say three months after the COVID infection, uh, would be a, a good time to get a, a vaccine. But I would love to see uh, one of my uh, other colleagues think about this question. I might just jump in on this. And um, as you know, a pulmonary doctor, uh, you know, one of my greatest fears is that my patients will get a viral infection because as I sort of mentioned earlier, we think that there are certain things that stimulate the immune system in the lung and maybe cause the lung to be damaged. What we wanna do is allow the immune system to be stimulated outside of the lung, like when you get a vaccine and it creates that response, but it doesn't damage the lung. And in fact, what it does is it essentially creates a defense system for the lung to, to limit the amount of a virus that can um, uh, invade your body and make you sick. And um, you know, one of the things that it, I think is important to recognize is that um, you know, these infections with COVID-19 um, really have led to the deaths of many patients and most of them have died related to lung failure, to their lungs being damaged in a way that they can't recover from that. Um, uh, one of our goals in having people vaccinated is that even though it won't necessarily prevent you from ever getting an infection, it will limit the likelihood 
that you would end up in a, need, being so sick you would need to go into a hospital or, or end up in one of our intensive care units on a ventilator. And that's, that's really why we're trying to encourage people to be vaccinated. And I, I don't know if somebody wants to talk about some of the um, data around um, the um, response to for patients who are immunosuppressed to vaccines. I think that's another issue that often comes up. Well, I mean, I think the thought is that if people are on certain uh, high risk medications in terms of immunosuppression, then they may not actually mount the same response to a vaccine. And so those are the people now that are really um, being advised to get uh, a third, basically booster vaccine if they got either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. And, uh, but it's very clear that there's certain medications um, that are uh, problematic and um, it's not so clear what the answers are, whether stopping it is gonna help in terms of response. And so there are actually ongoing studies that are being done funded through NIH to try to get a better handle on, for instance, if you stop an immunosuppressive for a week before and after the vaccine, does that make the response better? And we really don't have answers for that. All right. Um... Thanks for those answers. So um, next question, Carol, can you recommend a quality online pulmonary rehab program? Is there an online pulmonary rehab program, Dr. Danoff and Johnson? I would love to know that as well, actually, for my patients, if it is. Um, I can uh, give a shout out to the um, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. They've worked with the... Um, people who run pulmonary rehab programs to put up an eight session um, set of exercises and it's under their pulmonary rehab toolkit. Uh, there are also several other online uh, sessions that are available that people can use. Um, and I definitely would recommend uh, taking a look at them. And um, the nice one, the nice thing about the PFF one is that um, it includes also an educational component, which is one of the things that's very valuable for our patients who actually are able to attend pulmonary rehab. And I should just kind of preface this by saying that many of our pulmonary rehabs were closed because of COVID in order to limit the risk of having participants who had lung disease become infected. And so that's why there's now an interest, more, more of an interest in online. The other thing I just wanna put a shout out to is the folks, um, primarily in, in Europe and in um, Australia have been really piloting this notion of doing remote pulmonary rehab. And so I would just um, also encourage you to take a look at some of the, um, the things that are available for remote pulmonary rehab. And again, primarily um, coming from Europe, um, Dr. Um, Helena um, Alexanderson, and then also from Australia. All right, uh, that's great, uh, very useful information. Um, so any update on calcinosis, anything we can take, I will give it to Dr. Worth. Thanks, Rohit. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so calcinosis is a really a huge problem and we really don't have a good answer yet for how to handle it. Um, there have been a number of different uh, approaches. I think if there's, um, you know, a very superficial calcinosis, sometimes we use a th uh, sodium thiosulfate cream that I think can be helpful, but for many people with calcinosis, it's deeper and not going to help. Um, I, I know that there are people that have done IV um, formulations of this, and I don't know that we have any data to suggest that would be helpful. Um, and I always say, if you have a long list of drugs that you try for diagnosis, that that's not a good sign. Um, we don't have good studies, and I don't think we, m many of them don't have good efficacy. There are individual case reports of people using, for instance, bisphosphonates, um, such as you know, actinel or fosamax. But again, I think it's very difficult to say that they work. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, stay tuned. I think we need a lot more studies to understand why this happens and then how to treat it. Um, anyone else has any experience, um, Dr. Device, do you have any experience with um, calcinosis? <laughs> so calcinosis is no, one of- No, sorry about, uh, no, I don't. Okay. 
Um, yeah, calcinosis is, by the way, one of the biggest Achilles heel for rheumatologists and dermatologists. It's very difficult to treat. However, there are some other encouraging results that I've seen recently. Um, the class of drug called JAK inhibitors. Um, you know, there are there's just one study in which they showed that the calcinosis in juvenile uh, patients with dermatomyositis improved. So uh, we are going to look into more if that's truly pan out or not, but it's a, it was a small study. I just thought I'll mention that. Um, next question, Dr. Danoff. Uh, I have I had extreme muscle weakness and shortness of breath after several years of no problem with dermatomyositis or lupus since taking medicine. Then I was diagnosed with ILD and had ground, ground, a glass, ground, glass opacity, ground glass opacity and great, oxy, uh, great oxygen PFT test. My uh, blood marker showed in no blood marker showed inflammation. In one year, I had CT scan that showed no changes in first ILD CT scan. So pulmonary doctor said I was doing great and keep up the IVIG. I get to every eight weeks along with hydroxychloroquine daily and plaquenil daily, which is the same. Doctor said I don't need another CT scan and I'm fine as long as I have no breathing issue. I do have breathing, but breathe fine. I respond to therapy and I do aerobics in pool and wonder if not getting another CT scan until I have symptom is okay. He was told, he also told me that to lose 30 pounds since I'm 50 pounds overweight and don't come back until I do. Wow, that has a lot in it in that question. And I'm just going to um, try to make a couple points from it. One of the things that I think a lot of our patients find very frustrating is that autoimmune diseases don't all kind of show up at once. It's not like on day one, we know what organ systems are going to be involved. And very often what we see is that somebody who maybe starts off with some skin or muscle disease, then over time might develop lung disease or other, or it may be reversed. You may end up with lung disease and then end up with muscle or joint disease. And so I always think about autoimmunity as being, being like peeling an onion, like there's another layer underneath it. And so that's part of the reason why it's so important to have follow-up with a doctor, even if things feel good, like right in the moment, which is great. I'm, you know, I'm glad that you did well for that period of time. Then if as new things come up, they need to be treated. And um, you know, we have various ways of measuring whether what we're doing is making disease better. And I'm going to also have Dr. Johnson weigh in on this because, I mean, one of the things that we often wrestle with is like, how's the best way to tell if somebody is doing better from a breathing standpoint? So we do these things called pulmonary function tests, which are a way of measuring the size of the lungs and how well the lungs absorb oxygen. We also do CT scans. But one of the things about CT scans is that it exposes um, the patient to radiation. And we don't really like to use that a lot because we don't want to, even though it's safe to do, we don't want to do it excessively. Um, and then the last issue that you brought up in this is the impact of weight on lung function. And you'll remember that I pointed out that there is that big muscle of breathing called the diaphragm. And when the muscle becomes weak, the diaphragmatic muscle becomes weak, if you have extra weight, especially if you carry the weight at your middle, it tends to push the diaphragm up and that causes the lungs, which are very compressible, to get smaller and smaller. So for some of our patients, losing weight actually has a huge impact on their breathing just because that muscle is not really getting stronger. And the only way to make the lungs function better is to decrease the pressure on that muscle. So let me just... Um, uh, ask Dr. Johnson if she wants to comment a little bit on that, on how she monitors how patients are doing when they're treated for their interstitial lung disease. All right, so I agree with Dr. Danoff that um, it can be pretty tricky. Um, and a lot of patients are reassured by having serial imaging, um, but that typically is not how I'm monitoring my patients who are not having new or worsening symptoms and who have stable lung function. And so really um, what we tend to do is to monitor the lung function very closely. And in someone who has a new diagnosis, I would say that that should be around every three to four months or so. Um, and then as time goes by, and if you've had a period of stability that can be spaced out to every six months. And then some people who have been diagnosed 
long ago and who have been stable for many years, I might only see them once a year. Um, but I do think that um, to answer your question about feeling a little bit of uncertainty about being told you're doing well and is it okay to have a period of time, I do think that having that serial lung function measurement would be helpful. And again, I would reserve doing a CT scan unless your lung function changed or you develop new symptoms because generally it's just not a terribly helpful way to monitor people for progression. Excellent. Thanks for those comments. Um, um, Mark asks, are frequent intermittent fevers related to, or in your experience, have you seen this in dermatomyositis patients? So maybe Dr. Deweiser and Dr. Worth can comment on this. Dr. Worth, please, could you take this? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, fever can certainly be seen. Uh, and uh, it can be a sign of uh, activity. I mean, there are many causes of fever and you'd have to really kind of make sure you're not missing other, other, other causes, but um, it is on the, uh, a definite possibility and there are some acute phase uh, proteins in the blood that can be screened to see if there's some correlation. Um, but yeah, I would say um, certainly can be, but it doesn't have to be related to yeah. that. Yeah, and I would like to add, typically when we see fevers due to dermatomyositis, they're typically low grade and they're typically during the active phase of the disease. When the disease is really active, initial diagnosis, when there hasn't, the patient hasn't been treated, that's when we see fevers. Um, if you're getting fever and your dermatomyositis generally is well controlled, your muscles are doing good and your skin is rash is not very bad and your lungs are okay, then I think you need to investigate why you're getting these fevers beyond dermatomyositis. Just blaming it on dermatomyositis in that case may not be the right choice. So I think you need to look into other causes of those fevers. So next, um, I was diagnosed with dermatomyositis in December. I had bad skin rashes, muscle weakness, and shortness of breath. I was told after my CAT scan, I have pulmonary fibrosis. I'm wondering if I have ILD or not, or do I? Um, I have asthma too. I'm concerned because sometimes I get short of breath still. I'm on Celsep, Adware. Should I be asking for other medication or other things for my lung? I think this is a great question for our pulmonary colleagues here. Right, so um, I guess the, the first thing I would mention is just that, um, you really want to make sure that if you have abnormalities noted on your CT scan that you're being evaluated by someone who has understanding of interstitial lung disease because not all evidence of scarring in the lung is ILD, um, but given your background, I would be highly concerned that that would be the case. Um, it can be difficult sometimes to locate physicians depending on where you live who have that level of expertise. Um, at least here in the United States, Dr. Gamow already mentioned the resource of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, which has a network of centers where you can identify people who have expertise in ILD. And so it sounds to me like there's still some question about an underlying diagnosis. And so it sounds like you need to be evaluated by someone who specializes in ILD, who can review your CAT scan closely and determine whether they think those changes that they see on the CAT scan are ILD or something else. Thank you. Um, I have dermatomyositis for 21 years, no prednisone for last five years. That's excellent. I had a chest CT scan for something else and there was a small nodule in one lung and subsegmental atelectasis. No one says anything about it. Should I be concerned? This is one of the, uh, the kind of unintended consequences of us having such good CT imaging. Um, as the CT scans have gotten better and better, we're able to see smaller and smaller changes in the lung. And as I mentioned earlier, the lungs are really in the outside world because you're constantly breathing stuff. And even though there's a certain amount of protection from the mouth and the airway, little bits of dust can get into the lung. So, um, depending on where you live and what kind of environment you in, you're in, you may well have a small nodule that's related to something that you inhaled years and years ago that your lung 
just walled off and put a little a little kind of wall around it so it didn't get um, didn't cause further damage. Now the problem is that when you see these nodules, you have to decide is this something new or something old. And so often what will happen depending on the size of the nodule is we can figure out is it something that's more likely to be worrisome like an early cancer or is it something that's more likely to be as I mentioned, just one of these little inflammatory nodules. And typically your doctor or the radiologist will say, this is of, of a size that it requires a follow-up CT scan if it does. And they'll often say it, if it doesn't, they won't, they'll say it doesn't require it. Now, the question about the subsegmental atelectasis, the word atelectasis just means that a section of the lung has kind of collapsed on itself. As I mentioned, the lung is very squishy, like a very soft sponge. and so. If something pushes on it too much, like if the diaphragm is elevated because of the stomach being enlarged, then, or the abdomen being enlarged, it can cause a section of atelectasis. There's also sometimes where you get atelectasis because there's a little something that's blocking an airway going into that section of the lung. And so again, it really depends on what the context is. And if it is something that is stable over time, it probably is something that really doesn't need to be worried about. If it's something that changes over time, it might be something that requires more investigation. But one of the things that I would always suggest is that if there's something that you see in the results from your testing and it concerns you, raise it with your doctor and ask your doctor to explain sort of what, what it can mean and what the options are in terms of following it up. And it may well be that they can offer you the background information that would make it easier to understand why it is that they are or are not recommending that you have any further follow-up on it. Great. Thanks, Dr. Danoff. Um, next question is, di I'm diagnosed with, um, diagnosed with dermatomyositis in March of this year with high TIF1 gamma antibody. If I have had no muscle involvement so far, what are the chances I could have involvement in future? That's number question number one. And then also, I'm going to see a pulmonologist in two weeks. What should I be telling and asking doctor for this initial appointment? I anticipate he may not know about dermatomyositis and connection to ILD. So I think the first part of the question, I uh, will uh, respond and then I'll see Dr. Words could respond as well. Um, if you have not had muscle involvement so far and you were diagnosed in December, uh, no, March. So within six months, um, we see sometimes muscle involvement happening, uh, you know, typically within six months, but sometimes it is after six months and sometimes it's after a year or two even, rarely. But most cases would, if they are going to have muscle involvement, it will happen within the first six months, lesser in one, one year, and then further you go out, lesser are the chances for your muscle to be involved. I'll ask Dr. Worth if she can share her experience on this question. No, I, I agree completely with that. And I think the longer a person's out from uh, their, their whatever their organ skin involvement, for instance, it's less likely they're going to uh, have any problems. And although, you know, you still need to be followed and if there are no symptoms and new symptoms have developed that that needs to be evaluated. And I think for the second part of the question, I'll ask the pulmonologist to answer the question here is what should we be telling and asking the doctor at initial appointment? Well, okay. Well, there's a lot that you should, should ask. I guess to be really simple, I think that the first would be, you know, is there any lung involvement? Um, if there is lung involvement, what's the degree of impairment to your lung function? Um, and then a question that might be harder for the doctor to ask at the first answer at the first visit is, if there is lung involvement, do they think that you have active lung disease, meaning that this is something that requires treatment or intervention? And again, some of these questions will not be easily answered in the first visit. Um, you know, it can be very challenging when you see a pulmonologist, depending on their level of expertise. You know, is this a general pulmonologist or is this someone who thinks a lot about initial lung disease? Um, I would say that most physicians who specialize in ILD do have some working knowledge of myositis. Not think about as much as Dr. Danoff and I do, but they should be able to effectively treat and manage a patient who has myositis. Someone who's not as um, specialized in ILD, again, might not have that knowledge. And so I think that it's just important for you to be very clear and upfront about your diagnosis and your concern about that being an involvement. And if that physician does not have comfort in managing you, then they should seek to refer you to a physician who does. And so 
those would be the places that I would start. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Downs might have something to add. No, I, I think that that was a really good way of looking at it. I think that the key is communication. So, you know, talking to the pulmonary doctor about what your concerns are, you know, I just heard a webinar, they talked about this thing, interstitial lung disease, I've got dermatomyositis, I'm wondering whether I might have interstitial lung disease. That way it kind of orients the pulmonary doctor towards what the issues are. And then there are studies that can be done to really get a better sense of whether there might be interstitial lung disease. And, and then, you know, obviously there are lots of resources in terms of treatment if that is a problem. Um, but communication really is, is the first step. That's great. Um, so going to the next question, I think this is for Dr. Marianne, Dr. Deviser. I have antisynthetic syndrome with ILD. Um, all in remission for many years till recently. However, I did come down with a severe peripheral neuropathy and other neurological problems like drooling at the same time as ASS. I have been told that it is not related to antisynthetase. Any idea if it could be related to autoimmune disease? <clears throat> um, well, I, th I agree with the doctor who said that it's not very likely that it's associated with antisynthetase syndrome. Um, I have seen patients with, for instance, mixed connective tissue disease who have a, a neuropathy, but that is usually what we call a sensory neuropathy, uh, uh, manifesting with pain or tingling or something like that. But this sounds like there is also weakness of the muscles. And that is very unusual uh, in antisynthetase uh, syndrome, as is drooling. Um, so I, I think it would be very wise to uh, have a neurologist look at um, at these new complaints, and it might well be that it's either an, another Im, uh, autoimmune uh, um, disease, because indeed um, uh, there there might be several uh, immune related diseases, um, but it might also be quite another disease which manifests with neuropathy and and drooling. Excellent, thank you. Um, so um, there's a question saying many are wanting PET scan. That seems to be an overkill to me. I think this question refers to patient with uh, dermatomyositis and the screening of cancer. Um, so I'll, I'll take that question. So uh, actually, if you have very high risk for cancer, if you have dermatomyositis with TIF1 antibody, for example, then I think getting a PET scan, if your doctor really wants it, may not be that bad an idea. Now, sometimes obviously it could be an overkill because PET scans are very sensitive. It can detect some abnormalities that may not have any significance, but um, depends on what the situation is, how high is your risk, how worried is your doctor about cancer. Sometimes getting a PET scan might be the right answer. So it depends on the situation. So I do PET scans on my patients with dermatomyositis, with TIF1, gamma, with high risk. Um, I, do, I sometimes do PET scan, not repeatedly, but at least one PET scan I do at the baseline. Um, wondering why itch is not on the study of patient experience. So many I speak with who have myositis are just unglued, keep us from sleeping. Um, day and night itch is life altering, can last for years, even on meds. Uh, Dr. Worth, this is an excellent question for you. Yeah, I. <clears throat> We always include itch as a very important outcome in these uh, in dermatomyositis studies. Um, we're very aware of the impact of the symptoms, and that's why we need to have new therapies and new approaches. So um, itch is included. Um, we're still learning more about what's the best way to measure itch, but um, we all agree that it's very important. Excellent. Um, so next question is, I have dermatomyositis, lupus, RA, ILD, Renaud's, mechanics hand exactra and yet no myositis antibodies were found and no inflammation markers found. Am I an anomaly or could it be that I have antibody not yet identified? I think Dr. Danoff spoke about it a few questions ago that the fact that you don't have a myositis antibody basically means you don't have a known myositis antibody. So it could be that you have some unknown, undiscovered, yet, yet not known myositis antibodies 
So that would be pretty much simple answer that I have. I, I don't think this is an anomaly. We see 30% of patients have no myositis antibody. When I say no myositis antibody, what I mean is no known myositis antibody. But as Dr. Danoff <coughs> was earlier <coughs> talking, that we see some unidentified bands on these <coughs> tests that could be an antibody is just not very well recognized. <coughs> Right, um, Dr. Danoff, you wanna add anything there? No, I, I completely agree. And I just sort of the, to, you know, just put it out there that we don't actually know all of the myositis antibodies. And so, you know, the, the fact, it really is whether all of the other pieces fit with it being myositis or not. And the antibody is helpful because it allows us to kind of confirm in a way that we feel comfortable with it. But it's very true that about a third of our ILD patients have an unrecognized autoantibody, or they only have a myositis, what's called a myositis associated antibody. Uh, so not one of the ones that's specific to myositis. Thank you. Uh, does IVIG have COVID antibodies in them? And if they have been harvested uh, within the last nine months? And I can take this question because I recently reviewed this data. Actually, what it turns out, if your antibodies were harvested in last nine months, there's about 80% or more chances that that IVIG product that you're getting has COVID autoantibodies uh, or COVID antibodies that will provide you with partial protection. The reason I say partial protection is these antibodies are sort of a passive immunity. They're not going to last forever in your body. So maybe for the time when you get IV infusion, you might have some protection from COVID, but that does not mean or should not mean that you should not get COVID vaccine because COVID vaccine is likely to get you better protection, both from B, B cell, which is antibody driven, and also from T cell immunity. So I, I don't want people I, people who are taking IVIG and who knows that now they're getting probably COVID antibodies through IVIG to think that they don't need vaccine. <clears throat> uh, next, risk of heart attack in myositis as complication. I had a blood clot heart attack nine years into IVIG. I'm 57, family history, but no signs of plaque via coronary CT scan. How should a myositis patient monitor their heart and diabetes risk? Boy, that's a that's a tough question. Um, maybe I'm. Well, can to... can I start? Can yeah, I start? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, you you will probably take the IVIG part, but uh, there is uh, accumulating evidence that the heart muscle is also involved in the inflammatory process. But the problem is that it's often uh, what we call subclinical. Um, that if you do a cardiac MRI, that uh, it's obvious that there are um, abnormalities which may reflect inflammation of the heart. So uh, uh, currently, um, much more investigations on the heart muscle is, is being done by MRI. But there is one other thing. Um, all the medication we prescribe, and especially uh, prednisone, uh, uh, gives rise or may give rise to increased blood pressure and uh, elevated um, uh, uh, blood sugar. Uh, and that is often associated uh, with an increased risk of heart infarctions and, and, and strokes. So there are several ways why people with myositis uh, can have uh, strokes or heart infarctions. And I'm sure that you are going to take the uh, IVIG. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think the point that Dr. Weiser just said that there are many reasons how heart can be involved in myositis, not just one. And, you know, she spoke about, you know, having heart, direct heart involvement from myositis because heart is also muscle. And also the complication from medication can cause increase what we call, call atherosclerosis. Uh, you know, so the patient with myositis, long-term disease and long-term medication like steroid can develop coronary artery disease. But I also, I want to touch upon the third component that Dr. Weiser was uh, talking about IVIG. IVIG actually can cause blood clot and cause heart attack itself. So the fact that you've been taking IVIG for nine years, 
my recommendation would be to see if that could be a reason for your heart attack. And if that may be a plausible reason, then cut down your dose of IVIG or decrease the rate at which you're getting IVIG. Uh, again, we have seen in the studies that if the rate of IVIG or the dose of IVIG is very high, then there could be thromboembolic complication, which includes heart attack. So just those are the things that you may want to discuss with your doctor. What is the reason of your heart involvement and what can be done about it? Can I just mention one other yeah. thing? Um, sure. It's really important to get lipid studies done. Um, and the guidelines are really thinking that people who have sort of more of a chronic inflammatory process should probably have a lower LDL than uh, are uh, taken into account with conventional guidelines. And so a large percentage of people probably have two who have dermatomyositis have their LDL levels just too high. Um, and I will point out also that the, the CT and, uh, test that you had done that didn't show any evidence of calcification is really more of a longstanding late disease and there are other ways of detecting plaque that may not be calcified. So I think, uh, you know, I would recommend that you see a preventive cardiologist or a card who can manage uh, the, the uh, lipids because that's really an important aspect. And we have a lot of new meds now that can really bring down the lipid levels. Thank you. Um, thank you for your response. I am 73 and reside in New Jersey area. There, are there any studies or facilities working on calcinosis issue? If so, where? I know that NIH, which, it has, uh, which is near Baltimore, Bethesda, has studies on calcinosis. So you may want to contact um, Dr. Lisa Ryder. Um, uh, who are who's heading those studies at NIH on calcinosis. I don't know the status of those studies, but I know that they are doing some work on calcinosis. I don't know if anyone else has know anything else. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question, I have dermatomyositis, polymyositis, TIF1 gamma antibody for five years, onset at age 36. All the treatment via clinical trial has saved my life at this time because of COVID-19. I'm finding my care with rheumatologists, immunologists, neurologists, et cetera, to be problematic. Long wait time, not looking at labs, poor relationship with hospital. I've been advised that this may not get better anytime soon due to long COVID. I live in Florida. Should I consider moving? And if so, where? Wow, that's a complicated problem. And um, I mean, I, I can start, I think um, yesterday I presented with Dr. Gupta, uh, you know, the problems our patients are facing because of COVID-19 and it's rampant. We, when we talk to the patients, what we realize is that sometimes even doctors don't know how much problems our patients are facing due to the lack of access or lack of, for example, pulmonary rehab, Dr. Donoff talked about, or sometimes getting IVIG infusion because infusion centers are closed you know, or are, are not running to the full capacity. So there's a lot of issues going on because of COVID-19. And I totally agree that the, the issues that you're facing is not only you're facing, many of our patients are facing the same issues. And I really don't think the solution would be to move because pretty much anywhere you move, it could be the similar issue. Um, however, more I would advise you to be vocal and try to reestablish the relationship that you previously had with your doctor and explain that, that you have some needs and you, know, you would be looked at, want to be looked at. And if your doctor is not really doing in-person care or you know, in-clinic care, then perhaps starting with the telemedicine may not be that bad an idea, at least to start, because a lot of things can be done through telemedicine. A lot of things cannot be done but a lot can be achieved. So at least start there and start having some regular visits with your doctor. So no more comments. So I will go to the next question. I have dermatomyositis for six years with no lung issues. I have more skin involvement than muscle. Is ILD something I could get down the road? Um, along the same line, but knowing everyone is different, what types of issue, if any, do people seem to develop around down the road? So that will be Dr. Johnson and Dianoff. Could this patient develop ILD down the road? Six years into the disease and no lung issue.
Um, I can start. So, so the answer is potentially, but unlikely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, most autoimmune conditions in terms of lung involvement, we do tend to see that most of the risk, um, although as Dr. Dehoff has mentioned, the lung involvement can be the primary presenting symptom, but most of the risk is earlier on in the disease involvement. And so particularly if lung involvement has not been something that you've experienced to date, the more time that goes along, the less likely it is that you're going to develop an interstitial lung disease. Now, if you were to develop problematic symptoms, I don't think that you should discount it just because 10 years has gone by, um, but again, it'll be unlikely. And so I think that you should have those symptoms evaluated, but you know, I get patients refer to me all the time who are, you know, a decade or more past their autoimmune diagnosis. And I can probably tell you on one hand, how many of those patients actually turn out to have ILD at that point. Um, and so again, unusual, but any new symptoms should be taken very seriously. All right. I just, I just want to follow up with one thing, which is that we tend to get very, uh, when you have an unusual diagnosis, like dermatomyositis or interstitial lung disease, we tend to focus on that when a symptom develops. But having one of these diseases doesn't prevent you from having all the other normal things happen. And so just going back to what Dr. Deviser and Dr. Agarwal were talking about regarding, um, you know, uh, prevent, um, uh, cardiac prevention, I mean, you know, all the normal stuff happens. People get heart disease. They get, you know, all of the other kind of chronic medical diseases that can occur over time. And so I think that if you develop a new symptom, it's important to think about whether it's part of the disease process that we're talking about, these autoimmune diseases, but also remember that it can be just all the regular stuff that happens to everybody who doesn't have a disease like, like an autoimmune disease. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ward, I have five years diagnosed dermatomyositis, recently started to exhibit hives when I get IVIG. Any clues? I mean, it, it definitely can happen. Um, I'm assuming you don't get any respiratory symptoms, which would be uh, probably more concerning. Um, one way thing to do there is to consider it, um, changing the formulation just on the off chance that's uh, and something is in that particular formulation you're getting. And the other would be to pre-medicate with uh, nanohistamine uh, and see if you can block um, the hives. But if they continue or get worse, you know, that becomes a little more problematic. Thank you. Um, this is a long question. I was diagnosed with dermatomyositis in March 2021. There is a question of being juvenile myositis and undiagnosed. I have mast cell activation syndrome, Hashimoto's, Raynaud's, chronic asthma, and several other autoimmune diseases. There's a question of overlap syndrome as well. I'm currently taking prednisone, plaquenil, and third month of methotrexate. I have been anemic for a long time and have been suffering with malabsorption and neither of those are addressed. The skin rash seems to be worse since starting methotrexate. Is that possibly from medication? Is it unreasonable to ask to see a hematologist? Side note, my last two colonoscopies seven months apart showed new tumor growth. Oh, a lot of different uh, issues and questions here. Maybe Dr. Ward, you can... Um, maybe address part of it you know i i, I this is a complicated question yeah. um for sure um and you know one question i guess i would have is how long the you've been on the plaquenil i would say you know pe about 20 percent of people who get plaquenil and have dermato actually get um a rash and so the, if it's really getting worse it'd be i think worth having that evaluated i would be less likely to blame the methotrexate i really don't see a lot of eruptions from that um and i think that um i guess one of the questions would be about the anemia I mean, it's maybe tied in with the autoimmune disease, uh, and um, I don't usually find, unless there's some other thing going on, uh, such as perineoplastic, <laughs> that the hematologist would have that much to offer, but it may still be worthwhile, given the fact that there seems to be some other colon issue. I'd like to know more about that. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot to, to sort of dissect to understand how, uh, how to help you. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, since there's a lot going on and uh, one, your plaquenil comment is excellent. I have seen myself many times that plaquenil in some patients might make the skin rash worse. Um, but 
Also, uh, there seems to be a tumor issue here with colonoscopies showing new tumor growth in a patient who's recently diagnosed with dermatomyositis. I would be very worried about possible tumor. So I think you need to definitely not on, you need a GI and a hematologist to work on this, these two issues. Next, my daughter has been suffering with dermatomyositis for 11 years. She, on, she has only skin, not muscle impact. She has been on a cocktail of medication and her skin issues flare have been only relieved by IVIG. She's 29 year old and trying to establish career, the time needed for IVIG does not allow her to work full 40 hours a week. And are there other by mouth medication available to address the skin issues? And we are very hopeful for lenabesum, but disappointed with the muscle result. Hopefully lenabesum can move forward for skin. So I, I want to take a first jab at this. this so this, uh, the issue with IVIG is the time and logistics are very challenging for our patient, especially younger patients who are working full time. It's very difficult to take out time from their work. So one of the things that I have started doing at least in last year is some of my, those patients, I moved them to sub QIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin. With a, with a significant success, actually, many of those patients really love it because they love the flexibility. It's, little, it's a lot more work on their part, but it does give them a significant flexibility of their lifestyle and of their work time and so on. Um, so I'm going to let Dr. Worth and uh, address the Lena Besson point. Yeah, I mean, what I would say also is because I think of the of observations that the sub-Q formulation is helpful, there's now an ongoing study that would be, I think, helpful in terms of getting easier approval for, for the sub-Q use, but I do think that that's a good. I mean, in terms of other oral medications, I mean, one some of them, I mean, depending on how bad the skin is, you know, we still use pla uh, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. Um, which works probably in 20, 25% of people. So it's not high, but it can be an oral that's usually pretty well uh, tolerated. Um, other approaches uh, orally would be methotrexate or mycophenolate, uh, mofetil, which are more immunosuppressing, but also can be very helpful um, if, if the sub-Q approach is not working or the IVIG is not something that's feasible. Um, and then lenabesum, yeah, I mean, I think this drug uh, has a lot of potential. I think the FDA, unfortunately, has made it very difficult. Um, and I think there's hopefully going to be room to find a path forward, uh, but it's not going to be immediate. So I think you, I, the reason I brought up the data is just that it's very interesting and it's, we really need a drug that's safe and working. Um, but it shows that the, some of the regulatory issues can be really major hurdles as well. So hopefully down the road we'll have that. And in the meantime, I think, you know, the other drugs that I mentioned will be uh, ho hopefully helpful. Thank you. Um, does sub-QIG reduce the risk of heart issues with IVIG? Mm -hmm. I think yes, although we don't have a solid data for that. There's a clinical trial that is going on that will be able to help that answer that question. But one of the reasons why IVIG leads to heart issues is because IV immunoglobulins are heavy proteins. So when we give heavy proteins all of a sudden in a day or two or three or four, uh, you know, basically that increases the viscosity of our blood and that increases the blood clot formation. The idea with sub QIG is because you're getting very little dose in a day or in a week, that issue doesn't come up. So yes, that's a definite possibility. Um, when would a physician consider putting a patient on new IVIG approved treatment for dermatomyositis? Now, I think that's a question that depends on your doctor and your disease status. I mean, I don't think I'm putting everybody on IVIG. It depends on the situation that the patient have. Um, so if you need IVIG, yes, definitely you should be put on IVIG. So that's a discussion you may want to have with your doctor. Is your disease control? Then there's no reason to be put on IVIG. If it's not, then it could be a consideration. In the DM remission, I, in DM remission since 2005, but still take hydroxychloroquine, have had two pericarditis attacks since 2013. Any possible link with hydroxy or other concerns? Huh, that's a, I'm not sure there is any link with hydroxychloroquine and pericarditis that I know of. Does anybody? 
I mean, my only comment would be that um, occasionally you can get muscle infiltration with um, hydroxychloroquine and there have been restrictive cardiomyopathies associated, um, but that would not be considered pericarditis. Um, yeah. And it would definitely be worth having a cardiologist think about whether the possibility that, you know, it's usually more in the setting of, of having, you know, heart failure and different things and not pericarditis that one would think about hydroxychloroquine, but it is something to consider whether it could be a side effect of using um, the, the hydroxychloroquine a long time. Perfect. Is calcinosis in any way related to coronary artery disease from accumulation of plaque? I don't think so. I don't think calcinosis has relationship with coronary artery disease, any direct relationship. Obviously, calcinosis means that you have a long-standing bad disease, and that itself may have a relationship with coronary artery disease, but I don't know about any direct relationship. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, can dermatomyositis be associated with autoimmune hepatitis? My liver enzymes are up and down and sometimes quite high. My gastroenterologist is concerned and called me her problem patient, but hasn't recommended any follow-up except to check liver numbers more often. Can anyone speak to this topic? I think this is an interesting question. Um, so let's see who wants to take a jab at it. Well, I, I'm not uh, aware and I'm not an expert on the association with autoimmune hepatitis, but a word of caution here, uh, what is meant by liver functions? Because we know that if you have active disease and a high uh, CK, high, high muscle protein, other muscle proteins like the transaminases may also be elevated. And sometimes they are also considered, considered liver functions. Exactly. I think the, you need to talk to your gastroenterologist and, and a rheumatologist or neurologist or dermatologist to see could liver numbers be up due to your muscle disease because the same liver enzymes are also muscle enzymes. So I think there's a lot more. And But also I do see autoimmune hepatitis being associated with different autoimmune conditions, including myositis. So that could be a real possibility. And last but not the least, many of our uh, myositis patients are on drugs that can cause liver function abnormalities. And also many of times they are getting steroid or are getting uh, you know, obesity that itself may lead to fatty liver that itself may then can cause. So there are many reasons for liver function abnormality. I think we need to dig deeper with your, you need to dig deeper with your doctor. I think in the interest of time, maybe I'll take one last question because we are about uh, ending and I want to you know, say a few words of thanks as well. Um, I was diagnosed with dermatomyositis in March, 2020, ILD in September, 2020, MDA five positive in January, 2021, ER visit on January, 2021 with pulmonary embolism. I'm not overweight. Prior to diagnosis, ran five miles a day, no medication, healthy diet. I have classic dermatomyositis symptom. I'm on prednisone, Celsep, Eliquis, Calcium, and Pentaprazole. I finally saw a rheumatologist at UCLA in April who prescribed IVIG and rituximab. I started IVIG four weeks ago, which is slowly starting to help, but fighting insurance for rituximab. My question, how frequently should I receive CT scan? How should I continue to fight for rituximab infusion? And I, I also have secondary Sjogren syndrome. Wow. So <laughs> uh, Dr. Danoff and Johnson, maybe uh, let's try to see if we can answer these questions. So uh, I'll start with one part of it and maybe I'll ask Dr. Johnson to respond to the other part of it. So, um, you know, MDA5 can be a very tough um, uh, disease to treat. I think that Dr. Johnson alluded to this earlier. Um, it's not unusual in my experience that it takes a variety of different medications to get it under control initially. And then hopefully over time, you'll slowly be able to come off some of those medications. Um, the issue about, um, about rituximab is one that I think uh, is not unique in your situation. Um, I think that the, I wanted to mention this actually specifically related to the conversation about IVIG getting FDA approval. There are a lot of medications we use in medicine that were not FDA approved for the thing that we use them for, but are still very effective and appropriate. And um, one of the things that we have a little bit of trouble with with insurance companies is if you have a rare disease like dermatomyositis or, or uh, polymyositis, 
is that there just aren't a lot of drugs that have been tested in a way that the FDA would approve them. And then what we have to do is go to insurance companies and say, this drug is still valuable, even though it's not FDA approved. And it sounds like you're in that situation. I would encourage you to persist. Um, I hope you won't need to um, have the rituxan in order to um, achieve remission, but sometimes it is necessary. And I think that often it takes um, the doctor speaking to the insurance carrier and explaining why it is the drugs being um, requested. There's lots of um, information out there, but not these things that are called randomized control trials, which is what um, the FDA typically is looking for in order to approve a drug. Um, and I'll just uh, hand it off to Dr. Johnson in terms of her comments regarding uh, how often a CT should be obtained. We, we have very few minutes. Last words, Dr. Johnson. Uh, well, and actually, I'll just add on about the rituximab is that um, the company that manufactures rituximab, Genentech, does have grant programs that patients can apply to directly. And so I do often go that route if I have difficulty with the insurance company and have gotten patients drugged that way often. Excellent. Well, first, I mean, thank you, everybody. I mean, I really want to thank our patients for asking such an intelligent questions. And I think it was a really uh, very uh, intriguing questions. And I want to thank our panelists. Uh, for uh, excellent answers, and I uh, and I also want to pay attention to this. There are some answers that Dr. Uh, Worth and Dr. Deviser, I think others have answered also through the chat means as well. So you can look at those as well. Thank you very much for joining everybody, um, all our patients and our panelists. Thank you.